Well, friends, we are in the final week of what has been a a four-week series looking at four different pieces of Scripture, one a week, that are commonly misunderstood, misinterpreted, or or misquoted within our popular culture. Uh, And this has been an opportunity for us to ask some questions uh, about how we understand the role of Scripture in informing the way we live. You know, it's been an opportunity for us to, to answer, how do you reconcile what Scripture says with your experiences of the world? You see, the reality is, if, if we don't do the hard work of, of asking questions of the text, then we can never claim to actually take this book seriously. Uh, More so, if if we don't ask the hard questions of the text, then we end up with, I believe, two choices. Uh, The first is, is we say, it just says what it says. The other is that we take Scripture with a grain of salt. We say, well, I, I know the Bible says that, but... And as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, I I don't believe that either of these positions are tenable. And so the only option left to us is to ask the hard questions, to go deeper. And the goal over these four weeks has not necessarily been to lay out the definitive interpretation of any one of these texts, but, but rather, here's my prayer. It's that in spending time digging deeper into these well-known, often misunderstood texts that we might become ever more convinced of just how precious this scripture is, that we might be ever more convinced of how much we need to spend time in this text, not simply on on a weekly basis here in worship together, but rather building it in as a discipline so that we would be spending time in Scripture on a daily basis, both individually and in community with one another. And and, and it's certainly no coincidence that this series is leading us into Rally Day, a day in which opportunities will be presented to you to get engaged and be involved in the study of Scripture, just as I have described. On Rally Day, you'll see opportunities to be involved in Wednesday night Bible studies, Bible studies like Better Man or our women's Bible studies, or to be engaged in our small group Bible studies. Friends, we believe that as a church, we are better when we are spending time being formed by the Word of God. So our scripture this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah. So we're back in the Old Testament after spending last week in the book of Romans. And I want you to pay attention as I read from Jeremiah 29 verses 4 through 14 and to see if you recognize the singular verse that inspired today's selection. I begin at Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4, and I invite you to follow along in the Bibles that you brought with you from home, your pew Bibles or your mobile devices. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. 
For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus, says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm. To give you a future with hope. And then, when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, my guess is that you have heard this parable that I'm about to share before. There was a couple who was newly married, and the husband began to make dinner and took the pot roast out of the refrigerator and promptly cut off the back third, threw it in the trash, and put it in the pot. And his spouse said to him, well, why did you just cut off a third of the roast and throw it out? And to which he responded, well, that's just what my parents always did. She said, but why? Well, I don't know. Let's give them a call. And so he called his parents and, and, and said, mom, dad, why, why do we cut off the back end of the roast? And they said, well, I don't know. It's just what my parents always did. He said, let's call your grandparents. And so they did. They called grandma and granddad and said, hey, why did you always cut off the back third of the roast? To which they responded, because the roasting pan was too small for the whole roast, right? Now, there are a couple of interesting things, I think, about this story. And first, the obvious takeaway here is context certainly matters, right? But what also occurs to me is this, is that This doesn't mean that two generations of pot roasts weren't any good, right? I'm sure it was still delicious, gathering around the dinner table together, eating this two-thirds of a roast. But what is also true is that for two generations, there was a whole lot of meat thrown needlessly into the garbage can. In the same way, our scripture passage for today and the verse which inspired its selection, although I believe is commonly quoted out of context, doesn't mean it's had any less value. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, for surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Just because this is removed from context regularly, in fact, I've got a confession to make. As uh, having spent 10 years in youth and college ministry, this passage became a bit of an eye roll around graduation time. You will notice it now, too, and now it will bother you. You're welcome. <laughs> Every card with a Christian theme has this verse. And look, it is true that God wants good things for God's children. Absolutely. But it is also true that when we pull this verse out of its context, there's a whole lot of protein that ends up in the trash can. There's a whole lot of substance that we miss 
by oversimplifying what Jeremiah is seeking to communicate. And so today, let's discover together what it was that Jeremiah was saying, and let's discover who it was that Jeremiah was writing to, because I can tell you it was not the graduating class of 2024. The book of Jeremiah is addressed to the exiles in Babylon. In fact, the, the passage that we have today is, is, is part of a letter that is written to the exiles who've been taken off to Babylon. So just to cover a few hundred years quickly, this summer we spent some time in the books of Samuel and Kings, establishing the monarchy in the kingdom of Israel. And King David and King Solomon both ruled over a united kingdom. After King Solomon, there was friction within the kingdom and it split into two, the kingdom of Judah in the south and the kingdom of Israel in the north. Now there were surrounding powers in the region at the time. And the first was the Assyrian Empire. The kingdom in the north essentially became a vassal state of the Assyrian Empire. The king of Israel was essentially a puppet regime. And after some time, this king decided that they were going to revolt against the Assyrians. The Assyrians reacted swiftly and crushed the revolt. Not only did they crush the revolt, they took those leaders in the kingdom of Israel and took them off to Assyria. And we never really hear from these tribes of Israel again. These are commonly referred to, these 10 tribes that made up the kingdom of Israel, 10 of the original 12, they're often referred to as the lost tribes of Israel. And, and, and those who were not taken into captivity and taken off and remained there are believed to be the ancestors of those who are referred to in the New Testament as the Samaritans. The kingdom of Judah survived on, and the Assyrian Empire fell, and the Babylonian Empire rose to power. They came into conflict with the kingdom of Judah, and they conquered the kingdom of Judah. They burned and tore down the first temple, and they took the leaders in Jerusalem and carried them off into captivity into what is known as the Babylonian exile. These are the people that Jeremiah is speaking to here in our text for today. One moment. Now, the chapter immediately preceding today's text, we find the story of the prophet Hananiah. Hananiah was a false prophet. Hananiah was telling the people what they wanted to hear. And that was, don't worry, this exile is no big deal. It will be over in just a couple of years, so sit tight. Jeremiah tells them Hananiah is incorrect. In fact, Hananiah is going to be dead in seven months, which is what happens. And then we find our text today, where Jeremiah tells them, you are going to be in exile for how long? For 70 years. Now this number 70, it's not critical that we focus in on this specific length of time. What Jeremiah, what God, wanted them to understand, they weren't going anywhere. Because 70 years means that it's not until the next generation that the exile will be over. What Jeremiah wants them to understand 
is that they need to get comfortable. Amy and I find ourselves uh, in what feels like a challenging season of life. We have four small children, uh, and Amy, in, in these last two weeks, has made the decision to, to go back to teaching. So when James and Daniel, our twins, were born about a year and a half ago, she stepped away from the classroom. Um, so, so she has gone back into work. Our oldest has started at a new school, and our three boys are now in preschool at Happy Land. And, and in some ways, this has been a, a day that we have looked forward to. Because since 2019, when our first was born, we have always had an infant at home. And we've thought, it's going to be great when they're all in school. Well, in these first two weeks, we have yet to have a day that is exactly the same. And so every night, we find ourselves strategizing together. How is it that we're going to get everybody to where they're supposed to be and how are we going to be sure that everyone gets picked up from wherever they are when they're supposed to get picked up and so after working through those machinations each night we also find ourselves dreaming of a future day isn't it going to be better when all of the kids can get themselves in and out of the car on their own. Isn't it going to be better when all of the kids stay at the dinner table, eat their food, and clean up after themselves? Isn't it going to be better when the kids bathe themselves get themselves ready for bed and do as we ask. And after having done that enough evenings, we've begun to catch each other and we call these the better whens. Isn't it going to be better when? What are your better whens? What are those illusory markers out in the future that, that you are setting or have set? That life is going to be better when? Life's going to be better when I finally find the right person. Life is, is going to be better when we finally get a course of treatment from the doctor. Life is going to be better when I finally get that degree. Life is going to be better when. The Babylonian exiles have their better whens. Life is going to be better when we finally get to go home. Jeremiah seeks to cure their better whens. You see, he doesn't tell them that they're not coming home for another 70 years as bad news, but rather to deliver them good news. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. God is saying to them, work with what is in front of you. Do good where I have placed you. Seek the welfare of the city where you find yourself today and in doing you will find your welfare and friends that doesn't make verse 11 any less true for surely i know the plans i have for you plans for your welfare and not for harm to give you a future with hope 
Just as the reality is no less true that that God seeks your redemption, it is no less true that God has accomplished your salvation and the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet, God wants you to seek the welfare of the people and place where he has placed you today. Not because you are somehow working out your salvation that has been taken care of, but rather because God knows you will find your welfare in doing so. This is the same prescription that we find Jesus giving to the disciples later in the New Testament. When Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Seek the welfare of the city and the people where I have placed you. Friends, it's a cure for the things are going to be better when they finally figure it out over in Russia and Ukraine. Life is going to get better after this election is over. Things will be better when fill in the blank. The reality is we have the opportunity today to walk out of these doors and seek the welfare of the place where God has placed us and in doing so find our own welfare that already rests in the surety that God is holding all of it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.